All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, uh, I hope to stand a little bit on the shoulders of our brother Chad uh, this afternoon. Uh, he gave a dynamic uh, outline of the importance of typology and uh, the ramifications of what that means for New Covenant uh, theology and the study of New Covenant theology. And uh, it's kind of a part and parcel of a lot of what I've been doing over the last couple of years with just the whole identification of the new exodus paradigm and, and some of the old uh, the paradigms of the old covenant that I've been seeing and uh, I hope to share that with you today although imperfectly I didn't come prepared actually to give this this is kind of a last minute thing so please bear with me and forgive me I don't I don't have all of my material and or references here I think if I would have come fully prepare, prepared I would have had full color charts and everything for you but doing the best that we can under the circumstances so um, the, basically, the purpose of what I want to present today is not so much to look at types per se, but to ravish your hearts with the glory of God in the Amen. face of Christ Jesus. As, you, as we move through this, we're going to see Christ revealed to us, as it were, in all the scriptures, um, starting with what happened in the, what, what happened in the garden. And so... As we move through this, you're going to see a lot of repeating patterns, a lot of repeating paradigms, um, a lot of Jewish parallelism. Um, and as we look at it from a, a broad uh, aspect of it, you're going to see Old Covenant Age in contrast with the New Covenant Age. You're going to see the chiasm, as we talked about earlier today as well. So you're going to see parallelism. You're going to see a lot of couplets. Um, and that's the glory of how God revealed himself to us through the pages of scripture. I haven't made any of this up. Maybe some of what I'm going to in interpret or, or, or share with you may, might be a little bit of, uh, of my interpretation a little bit. But for the most part, this is a, a historical narrative of how history, redemptive history, unfolded to the glory of God. So... <clears throat> To introduce, uh, I guess, the overall paradigm, what we see from earliest inception in the garden is this whole idea of failure in the flesh and divine accomplishment. And we're going to see that worked out through all of history. So failure in the flesh and divine accomplishment. So failure in the flesh always comes as a result of sin, disobedience to God, to his commands, to his precepts, and attempting to do something in your own strength. Divine accomplishment, we're going to see, comes through the promise. It's always God's hand at work accomplishing his greater purpose, but it's always through the line of the promise, as we're going to see that. So, to start, um, we'll just start right at the beginning with Adam and Eve. Um, so, I, I don't have formal notes to go by, so I, I may be... Uh, starting and stopping a little bit, but basically what we have is <clears throat> in the in the beginning God creates the world out of nothing, ex nihilo. So God breathes and the world is formed into existence. There was light and dark, there was plant and animal, there was man and woman. Um, and, and right from the very beginning we see um, divine order. So we have light and darkness, we have plants, and then flesh, we have Adam, and then Eve. So there are these couplets of order that we see even in the opening record. And um, some of that corresponds to Adam and Eve, as, as we look at Adam and Eve. Um, in the garden, in the early account, it just says the man and the woman. They weren't actually named yet until after the fall. And that's going to be significant because we're going to see the same paradigm happened in Abram and Sarai here and later on Joseph receives a, or Jacob receives a new name and Joseph receives a new name and so you see this new new naming as it were in reference to God's promise going forth and and the glory of his revelation coming forth and I think eschatologically we can look down in revelation where we receive a new name, ultimately. Wow. Yeah. So, like, it's, it's pretty amazing. Okay, so we have the man who 
alone was created, and he alone received God's glory. We have the firstborn, the secondborn, firstborn, secondborn, firstborn, secondborn, firstborn, secondborn, firstborn, secondborn, shepherd, or, or sorry, crop grower, herder, and working to a divine, glorious climax of, of this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? But it's a climax where, you know, the two forces collide, as it were. And Adam, being the gardener, the last Adam, is the shepherd. So we're going to start seeing this chiasm and this outworking. That's no, just a metaphor. <laughs> as, as we go along, it's it's this is helpful. This is awesome. It's pretty Keep awesome. Going. It's pretty awesome. So okay, so we have Adam, and and or the man and the woman. Um, what we have in the man and the woman is the serpent tempts Eve. Eve comes with the fruit, and it, as it were, seduces her husband to transgress the covenant or the stipulation that God, Yahweh, God had made with Adam. Okay, so we have the whole concept of Eve taking of the fruit and seducing Adam with it, causing him to sin. Immediately, their eyes are opened. The, the tree of knowledge has brought to them the tree of knowledge. It has brought to them the knowledge, not the knowledge that they were hoping for. Okay, so we're going to see the same, we're going to see this played out later on in Israel too where the law all of a sudden brings to Israel the sudden knowledge of their sin because this is really the prototype and what we what we find in Israel at the giving of the law is the the fleshly wow outplaying of what happened here okay so <laughs> now some people don't say that there's a covenant there but I, I believe that there is Hosea seems to indicate that. He says, but like Adam, they, the Israelites, transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. So I think what the prophet is doing is looking back through history and seeing this paradigm worked out. So we have Adam being seduced by Eve. He partakes, they partake, they both fall into sin. Um, their, their eyes are opened, they're naked. Immediately they're naked, what did they try to do? They try to cover themselves in their own strength. So here we have failure in the flesh, an attempt in the flesh to make good in the flesh. That's not working. God comes along and says, where are you guys? What's happened? Um, they confess we're naked. How do you know you're naked? Did you eat of the fruit? And then the excuses begin. Um, and what happens is, they actually clothe themselves with probably the very leaves from which tree they ate. The, the sin becomes their clothing, as it were. So it's interesting because when God speaks to them in the garden, um, he issues a curse and a promise. And he issues a curse, he issues a curse to the serpent to Adam and to Eve. So to the serpent he issues two curses, to the woman two curses, to the man two curses. So there's duality even in this. So to, uh, to the serpent he says, you'll be on your belly, which I think means you, you're gonna be cast to the earth. Um, and that he would eat dust all the days of his life, which I think um, means that he would be devouring, as it were, men, creations of dust all of his life. Because the, mm. the devil goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Mm. So he becomes a devourer, as it were, of the dust, being upon his belly, upon the earth, seeking to destroy through devouring uh, sons of Adam. Right after that, we have the promise that God would put enmity between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring. And that the woman would eventually, the woman's seed, the offspring of the, the woman would eventually crush the serpent's head. And in doing so, the serpent would inflict a mortal wound upon that seed. To the woman, two curses. 
that uh, the blessing, the, the blessing of the, the promise would come through child, the painful childbirth. Or I'd like to look at it, not only physical childbirth, but a long history of eschatological childbirth, wherein the Messiah is brought forth out of a long history of painful travail throughout the history <coughs> of redemption. Um, and also that her desire would be against her husband, but he would rule over her. So thus the secondborn, the woman, would fight against the firstborn, but the firstborn would rule over the secondborn. So there would be this continuing enmity between firstborn and secondborn, but what we see is the firstborn ruling over, bringing into slavery, always afflicting, oppressing the secondborn. To man, uh, now named Adam, it was cursed with two things. Um, that the ground is cursed, and the, that the ground was, it was cursed and would only bring forth cursed fruit of the ground through much pain. Um, so again, I see this uh, particular curse talking about, yes, the curse of the ground itself, but the curse of natural born Adamic line of man, the, the fruit of the ground, as it were, the fruit of the dust, bringing forth nothing but perpetual curse. Mm -hmm. So it's not just talking about the creation and everything that comes up out of the ground, but it's talking about the curse that perpetually is going to be upon man. And secondly, that man would uh, return to the ground, to the dust from which he was taken. Ultimately, he would die. So ultimately, the firstborn figure was cursed with death, as God promised. And Eve, as it were, the secondborn, was, was given the promise of life, the promise of the seed to come. And that's why immediately following what God pronounced to them, Adam, as it were, in faith, calls Eve life giver. He, he looks to the promise and says life giver. Yeah. So, um, so we have Adam associated with being a gardener, Eve associated with being uh, a shepherd, as it were, a, a herder of animals in the context of, of naming the animals. Um, Adam's covering from the tree was fruitless. It was a failure. But then God comes along, and it doesn't say what kind of animal he killed, but provided for them a covering for their nakedness with skins. So there was a sacrifice there. There was a, a shedding of blood. So we, we have then the shedding of blood coming, as it were, to the second born line, which is going to carry the, the promise, as we're going to see. Um, <clears throat> as we move onward to Cain and Abel, it's basically the same story. Uh, it's a couplet of the same story. We have basically the same exact pattern. We have Cain and Abel. We have sin as it were crouching at the door the personification of sin so Satan crouching at the door seeking to devour him um, bringing him into temptation because of on account of Abel because Abel brought a more perfect sacrifice the, the blood of animals um, so Cain's jealousy Satan's as it were enticement through Abel Abel was slain and so that again is a, is, a, is a picture of the coming Messiah who would be slain on account of Adam. Um, then as we <clears throat> continue further, uh, we have uh, increasing population. We have an increasing um, um, sin and wickedness in the midst of the earth. Um, right before the flood, uh, the Bible describes that the sons of God um, take to them the sons of the daughters of men. There's a lot of debate on exactly what that means, but there was great wickedness in the earth. So God destroys the earth, raises up Noah, um, and there's some great recapitulation going on here because a lot of the creation imagery we see in the beginning, God again as it were, paints Noah as 
a new atom or a new creation. There's a lot of creation imagery here, creation language going on. So he is a, a new type of atom. Noah says becomes a man of the ground. And what does he do? He becomes deceived by the ground. He, he builds a vineyard, partakes of the wine, gets drunk. What happens? The same as what happened here, becomes naked and in need of a covering. And so his faithful sons, um, Shem and Japheth, bring a covering in and cover their father's debauchery, his nakedness, his sin, as it were, that came through the curse of the ground. So, again, the, the, the whole theme of Noah becoming a crop grower, being deceived, as it were, by the fruit of the ground, which deceived Adam, um, is replayed in Noah, his nakedness, his need of a covering. Um, then from him, Shem and Japheth, Japheth was cursed, and his line and Japheth's line actually become the Gentile line, um, which becomes Egypt and Assyria, um, Babylon, all of the nations which ever served to afflict or bring Israel into bondage became that line, as with Lot, as with Ishmael, as with Esau. So the firstborn pattern, the paradigm, within the biblical narrative is the cursed one, the cursed one who, who God rejects. Shem um, begat Terah, Terah begat Abram, Abram and Sarai. Um, they have, within their history, I won't get into it all because it's, it's massive, but basically, they have two Egypt experiences, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because of famine, go down to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Sarai becomes the secondborn. Sarai, as it were, becomes enslaved by Pharaoh in bondage in Egypt. So Abraham becomes enslaved on account of Sarai, just as Adam became enslaved on account of Eve. Um, through God's miraculous power, they are delivered. They have an exodus through which they receive riches, the spoils of the Egyptians. Um, this happens. <laughs> this happens. Yeah, this happens twice in their history. But intimately connected to these two Egypt stories is also the Abrahamic covenant itself. And there's some debate on the Abrahamic covenant, but I, I, it is my opinion that the Abrahamic covenant is given in two parts. Um, it is given um, to Genesis 15 and 17. Genesis 15 and 17. So the first utterance of the covenant, if you look at it with the shedding of blood and the animals and the darkness and the smoke and the vapor um, and the light, going through, it is, bears very similar resemblance to creational language where darkness was upon the face of the deep and the, the spirit was hovering upon the waters and God said, let there be light. So we have, as it were, the first part of Abraham's covenant was creational. And Abraham... By, or Abram at this point, by virtue of Sarai, her temptation, tempted Abram with the forbidden fruit, Egyptian fruit, of Hagar. Mm. Abram goes into Hagar and produces Ishmael. Ishmael becomes a perpetual curse. The covenant is renewed, or a new covenant. It's pointing forward towards the, the, the great eschatological Old Covenant, New Covenant. You, you, we have this, but the, the covenant is renewed, um, and it is a gracious covenant through which Abram and Sarah produce Isaac, the true son of promise. So the first covenant, or the first part of the covenant, however you want to say that, ends in, as it were, failure, producing a son of Adam. And the second produces a son of promise. Mm -hmm. And following the same paradigm, 
we have Hagar and Sarai produce Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael, again, becomes a perpetual curse to his brothers. Um, it's interesting to note that Ishmael uh, himself went on to have 12 sons, which became 12 princes of a kingdom, which we see again the godly line had a 12 prince kingdom, the 12 mm -hmm. tribes of Israel. Um, so Sarah produces Isaac, the son of promise. The son of promise, it's interesting to note, has um, as it were, an Egypt experience, but he never becomes enslaved in Egypt. He goes, uh, dwells on the outskirts of Egypt in Gerar. Um, he is a faithful husband. He represents Christ beautifully here because he is a faithful husband. He, even though the, the king desires her beauty, he does not allow that um, Rebecca to become enslaved. So he, as it were, redeems his bride and comes out with great riches and establishes a covenant of peace with his enemies around him. So he is, a, in the midst of this, a beautiful image of the person of Christ, the, the son of promise. And maybe that's why uh, Paul in, in Galatians says, you like Isaac are children of the promise, mm -hmm. children of the spirit. Um, so from Isaac we have Esau and Jacob. Uh, Jacob was a usurper. Um, he, as it were, has an Egypt experience, although he doesn't go down to Egypt, he goes to, down to Pardan Aran, um, where he becomes enslaved by his brother, was it brother-in-law or cousin or uncle, Laban? Um, but again, through God's mighty outworking, comes out enriched, following the same Egyptian paradigm. Um, from Jacob comes... Uh, Again, two lines. We have Leah and Rachel. What's interesting about this is that um, we have the, the 12, as it were, the patriarchs who come from Jacob, whose name is later changed to Israel. A Abram and Sarah, his name are later changed to Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. Um, but the Rachel's firstborn son Joseph goes down to Egypt and has two Egypt experiences in Egypt. And what I mean by that is when he goes down into Egypt, he's enslaved, he's sold as a slave, uh, then becomes, as it were, enslaved in Potiphar's prison uh, because he was falsely accused. And what we see happen there is two dream sequences. So uh, let me just refer to my notes for this. Okay, so there's two dream sequences. The first, um, he meets Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's baker and basically they prophesy and have two dreams and uh, one is beheaded and one is released and Joseph tries in his own strength to gain his freedom from his bondage but the cupbearer forgets about him then all of a sudden God divinely gives Pharaoh two sets of dreams so you have two dreams we have another two sets of dreams so we have two two and two um, we have this whole theme of, of couplets w within the narrative. We have, um, you know, Joseph prophesying about Pharaoh's dreams. He is divinely delivered, as it were. Um, he is exalted with riches and honor, and he is given a new name. Um, I, I won't attempt to pronounce it now, but he's given a new Egyptian name. Uh, Jacob's sons, there's famine in the land, um, and they have a dual or a two Egypt experience. So there's famine in the land, just like here, famine in the land. There's famine in the land, they go down to Egypt. Um, Egypt, or 
Joseph uh, enslaves one of the brothers until they come back with Benjamin. So he enslaves Simon, Simeon, and they go back and they tell a Abram or Jacob what had happened. They come back, and now he tries to ensnare Benjamin, but we have Judah who steps in the way, acting as a substitute for Benjamin. So we have, we have two Egypt experiences, we have redemption, all of this leading up to the glorious archetypical event of the Old Covenant Age, which is uh, Israel in the land enslaved by Pharaoh. So all of, all of this is pointing forward to the great Passover event. All of this is leading up to it. So we have Egypt. Um, they, uh, Israel ends up, the whole tribe ends up going there because of famine. Um, we have Egypt who are crop growers. They're rejected by God. They're idolaters. Uh, they are of the Adamic firstborn lineage. We have Israel who are herders of sheep, chosen by God. They're worshipers. They are Yahweh's firstborn. Now that's significant because in the Exodus event, God calls Israel his firstborn. Even mm. though Egypt here is a firstborn, he is calling them my firstborn. Mm. So there's mm. some significance there. So, I mean, I could unpack the whole Passover thing for you, but I've, I've done that already here. It's, it's just massively incredible the way uh, the types and figures line up to Christ. But basically, Moses is revealed as the deliverer, the mediator. Uh, it is through the past blood of the Passover lamb uh, that they, they triumph over Egypt's firstborn sons. Israel's firstborn sons become the blessed line. They come out with incredible riches, just like their forebears had. And they come out and they sing the Song of Moses. And it's, you know, the book of Revelation shows the church singing the Song of Moses and the Lamb, which is, I think is eschatologically significant because it yeah. ties all of this together. But we have 50 days after, they come out, they have the giving of the law. Again, when you look at the imagery and the language here at the giving of the law, it's another creational there's creational language and creational imagery here. You have darkness, you have light shining out of the darkness, you have God speaking, you have cloud and thick darkness, the spirit as it were hovering over the people, mm -hmm. giving of the law. And the thing about the giving of the law that I, I would just want to share with you is that, in my eyes anyways, it's a complete recapitulation of Adam's fall, of Abraham's unfaithfulness, of Jacob's unfaithfulness. It's, it's a complete recapitulation all the way back to Adam. So at Sinai, I'll just read, uh, Israel reenacted Adam's fall into sin when she broke uh, the law covenant. So Aaron was the priestly representative of the nation. He was the Adam. Israel, as it were, was the Eve. So Aaron, like Adam, was Yahweh's priestly representative and acting like unfaithful Eve, Israel tempted Aaron with the forbidden fruit of Egypt's false gods. Just like we've seen all the way back to Adam and again with Abram and Sarai. So we have this tempting, as it were, of Adam with the forbidden fruit of Egypt. Israel immediately falls into spiritual adultery through, through worshiping the satanic fertility god of Egypt. She played the harlot and broke faith with her husband Yahweh. Um, scriptures continually repeat this theme of Yahweh entering into marriage covenant through the law with Israel, espousing her as his own, as it were, taking her as his bride. And she continually over and over fails commits spiritual adultery and is sent into exile. Goes back into this Exodus theme and Exodus deliverance. Exodus 
bondage or Egyptian bondage and deliverance. It, she continually lives out this theme the rest of her days. So she plays the harlot, and like Adam and Eve, the people became debauched and naked. So Moses comes down and finds them in an orgy. They're debauched. They're, they're naked. They're in needing in need of a covenant or in need of a covering. Uh, the law covenant is broken. Moses smashes them. Israel, as it were, is now espoused to sin, to death, under the condemning power of the law. So the law becomes, as it were, the tree which exposes Adam's sin. Because all of a sudden, she sees her sin in light of the law, in light of the tree of knowledge. Mm. That's why Christ was hung on a cursed tree to redeem us from the curse of the law. It, it all points back to the same paradigm, the same thing. Um, so like the forbidden tree of Eden, the law exposed and un uncovered the knowledge of their sin of rebellion. And just like Adam, Aaron blamed the people for his sin. He said, not my fault. Not my fault. They tempted me. They deceived me. They wanted me to build the calf. Just like back in the garden. Um, <laughs> so, as it were, Moses renewed the covenant, made new stone tablets, and also gave Israel a covering for her sin, which was the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself was a tent made of animal skins. So it was a covering of skins, hearkening all the way back, as it were, to Adam in the garden. Um, and so the whole sacrificial system, the promise of the Lamb, pointed forward to Messiah's day when the curse of the law would be abolished through the shedding of blood and both would become one, mm. as it were, in Christ. All of this would be wow. fulfilled in Christ. So even Moses, this is just kind of an aside note, but even Moses' history uh, played out the dual Egypt pattern. Um, so mm -hmm. Moses was went down to Egypt, as it were, escaping death, escaping famine, escaping the, the edict to kill all the firstborn. So he was escaping death. He was raised um, in Pharaoh's household. And he tried in his own strength, his fleshly strength, he shed blood, tried in his own strength to deliver his people. Mm -hmm. And he had to, as, as it were, exodus out of Egypt. So he was exiled out of Egypt, where he spent 40 years in the wilderness. He returns to Egypt as God's divine uh, deliverer, mm -hmm. uh, deliverer from death, and through the Passover, through the blood of the lamb, not through the shedding of man's blood with his own hand, but mm -hmm. through the shedding of the blood of the lamb, mm -hmm. um, the whole nation is delivered where they spend another 40 years in the wilderness. So you see this recapitulating, ever-growing body of history and redemption in all of the couplets that we see. Um, it, it's just amazing. So even here we have a couple. We have Moses and Joshua. Moses ultimately, uh, you could say, lack of a better word, failed in his desire to bring his people into the promised land because of disobedience. So he and the, and the people perished in the wilderness. Joshua, as it were, <coughs> Joshua, as it were, the Jesus, the Yahweh's salvation, um, renews this is this I think is eschatologically important renews circumcision with the people renews circumcision so we have a whole picture of G Joshua as Jesus bringing about a new circumcision uh, bringing about a covenant of peace with the, the enemies as he enters into the promised land so this here is a whole picture of old covenant new covenant in itself then we have the couplet of Saul and David, one was unfaithful, one was faithful. We have the couplet of Bathsheba's illegitimate son, <coughs> Solomon. We have the further couplet of Israel, unbelieving Israel, who was scattered to the four winds and believing Judah. And then with, within Judah itself, we have the unfaithful and the remnant. Mm. So we have this whole kind of unfolding, es escalating paradigm. Mm -hmm. Oop. 
So if we look at this, this history eschatologically now, rather than just mm -hmm. historical redemptive, we see Christ as both the last Adam and the fulfillment of Eve's uh, <coughs> seed, the seed of the woman. We see Christ as the righteous one, as Abel, who shed his blood to redeem his line. Um, we see Christ as the fulfillment of Abraham's seed. We see Christ as the fulfillment of the Isaac picture. Jacob as Joseph, uh, as the godly line of Israel herself. The whole old covenant, the giving of the law, was the foreshadowing of the, the new covenant, the giving of Christ himself, the spirit. Um, I could go on. Even, even Noah, Christ brings a new flood, as it were, of judgment, a flood of fire into a flood of water. Um, so we see all of this gloriously pointing toward prefiguring Christ in every single detail of history. It's just amazing how all of these patterns repeat themselves and patterns within the patterns repeating themselves and showing the glory of God's creation, not only in creation, but in his word. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I, I've done another kind of study. I mean, we could go on all night, but I won't. But um, I, I've taken uh, Abraham's events and all of the events that happened in his life and put them side by side with the history of Israel and it, it pretty much pre pretty well matches up event for event exodus for exodus wilderness for wilderness bondage for bondage like it, it's fascinating it's, it's unbelievable how gloriously everything fits together and images itself and so that's why sometimes you hear me refer to Israel as Adamic Israel because that's what I see. I see Adam being the prototype, Adam and Eve being the proto-covenant, but it really it's, it's pointing towards the giving of the law and that which our condemnation comes from the law, not, from, not so much from, because the law wasn't given in Adam, it was given in Israel. And so I, I often refer to Israel as Adamic Israel. And then what's <clears throat> really neat when you look at this eschatologically too, through the eyes of Paul, um, we see that the, the line of Hagar, uh, which is Ishmael, he says, now belongs to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And basically to Christ, the Jerusalem above. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is yeah. that right there in Galatians is just absolutely fascinating because all of a sudden everything that had always been applied to those that were outside of Israel is now being applied to Israel itself. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know what, what's also interesting is I'm watching you uh, pour out these couplets of the first and second born, and, and same with the other side, uh, you have. Um, you have a pattern of the second born or the one who's not the first born yet receiving the birthright or the blessing right. all the way through. Right. So, yeah. Which is yeah. which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, this is just a, a playing out of Genesis three fifteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The all seeds, great, seed yeah. of the woman, yeah. the seed of the serpent running through the course of history. Yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. That's what that's what you're doing. The great Adamic paradigm repeats itself right. over and over again until and then you see it. The cosmic event, which is Christ Amen. as the last Adam. You see Satan against, the, against Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 5, you see it there. Yeah, just the, the two, two seeds. Two I mean, yeah. It was light bulb moment when I understood that everything's keying off of that verse. Yeah.